Cryptic Accounts, a podcast by paranoid people for paranoid people. This week on the show, we have John Keel and Operation Trojan Horse. I am your host for the week, Dennis Cheney. Super excited to be back hosting, and I had a lot of fun with this book. How are you doing, Patrick? I'm doing good. I'm Patrick Ryan. Uh, oh, yeah. Joined, as always, with Patrick Ryan. Wearing no, an appropriate it's... shirt this evening. Wearing oh, your yeah. Guardians of the Galaxy. I am wearing a Guardians of the Galaxy shirt. Yeah. So, I'll tell you what, man. Um, I wanted to do another book. Thank you, by the way, for really, really pulling the ship along the last few weeks. Um, like I said, I'm really happy to be back. Um, I got a book that I wanted to read for a really long time. Um, from an author I really like named John Keel. Have you ever heard of John Keel? Um, not outside of you talking about him. Well, the dude's like kind of a legend. Like he wrote a bunch of UFO books. He's really famous for putting like alternative spins on things. Like he coined the term ultra terrestrials mm. instead of extraterrestrials. Does that mean uh, something different? Yeah. Um, it means that like he thinks they're basically whatever it is, is kind of cohabitating on Earth with us. It's not necessarily from another planet. Okay. So anytime you hear that, like, he kind of originated that. Um, he was born in 1930s, son of a band leader. He was a Korean War vet. He was a journalist and author. He started traveling, writing news articles in his 20s. And his first book was actually about stage magic. He, like, went Wait, to... Wait, he did all that stuff you just listed by his 20s? No. Well, Korea would have had to have been later, right? It was in the 50s. That was in his 20s. Okay, well, yeah. it would have been in his early 30s that he started so investigating okay. UFOs full time. Okay. Really interesting guy. He's most famous for writing the Mothman prophecies. Okay. I am aware of that. I didn't know that was him. Or I am not putting that together in my head right now. Yeah, and that oddly plays into this story a bit, as we'll see. But this is his 1970 book. Um, called Operation Trojan Horse. And this was after about three years where he quit being a journalist and he just decided to investigate UFOs full-time. Okay. And this is also his first book where he said, there's something else going on here. So he begins the book uh, by stating that history prefers fantasy to fact. Legends endure while truth coughs up blood, which dries and fades. We are more enthralled with our interpretations of great events than with the events themselves. And if you want to believe the fancy ridden scribes who have painstakingly recorded the versions of man's long history, you may be ready to accept the fact that UFOs have always been up there. And at this point, he goes into how, in a lot of the book, he talks about how like some religious stuff might be UFOs, and I don't go into that a ton but he talks about how pretty much since the first time we had telescopes and we were looking to the skies, like in the modern age, we've been seeing these things. So he starts out by talking about the airship sightings in the 1890s, which we mentioned in our episode on UFOs in World War I, uh, where people saw these like large cigar-shaped craft, very similar to what people see today all over the world. And I did not know this, but apparently the first photograph of a UFO was actually taken in 1883 by a Mexican astronomer named Jose Benilla, who was observing the sun from his observatory in Mexico. Just when suddenly there, the sun like you do. Just like you do. When suddenly there appeared a long parade of circular objects that slowly moved across the sky. Although he counted 140, altogether he counted 143 of the things and captured them on his newfangled gadget called a camera. And these things are like, again, cigar shape, and also what he described at the time as spindle shape. Wait, okay, so they're in they're in like Earth's atmosphere, but he's staring at the sun when it happens. Is that what you're saying? He's observing, yeah, he was observing the sky, and then I'm just trying to think of what a camera, what an original camera, like what kind of quality is that going to be on that? It's photo? not the greatest quality. <laughs> but he was a very esteemed astronomer, and like he should not have been witnessing these things. This was not okay. like comet or whatever so five years before that in 1878 a texas farmer reported seeing a large circular object pass over his field at a high speed and made history by describing it as a saucer man then, can you imagine it like the 1800s you're plowing your field 
airplanes aren't a thing yet. Mm -mm. Birds are the only thing you know about that flies. Oh, yeah. People yeah, yeah, are barely talking about flying at this point. It would freak you out. He goes even farther back in history and tells of a strange story investigated in France in 1790 when numerous witnesses saw a glowing globe that appeared to crash, and that's a common theme here, into uh, basically a countryside. And people went to it, and heat from the object caused small grass fires, and it was warm to the touch. The eyewitnesses included two mayors, a physician, as well as nu numerous local authorities and dozens of peasants. As the crowd gathered around the object, a door opened, and out came a person, just like us, but dressed strangely. He came out, said something in a strange language, and ran away into the forest. And when he ran away, the craft exploded into like a strange multicolored dust. It just kind of poof. It became a dust in the field. All right. I, I mean, I... Whoa. It's weird because like the farther back you go, like they're basically, that's a UFO encounter. Like a glowing disc that comes down and someone yeah. walks it. But it's just like more, well, arguably more bizarre because we're going to get into how this parallels more recent stuff. But it exploded into dust. Like it went pop. So like imagine just like a balloon popping and like a bunch of sand. I'm having a hard time not seeing some sort of a glitter bomb. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I know it's probably not actually. the right thing. But that's the way I see it, is just this little gray guy just go running away, and then just like, poop, and it's just I a think, bunch of sparkly stuff. I think you're actually, that's closer to what they saw than what and other people And just a bunch of, imagine. what, confused French people standing around going... That's exactly what it is. And it's funny, too, because, like, kind of the whole trickster aspect of this it gets into, the guy came out, and he just, like, said one thing in nonsense. He's like, blah, 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 and then just, like, runs away, and then it goes, poof, and that's all they were left with was just a bunch of dust. I'm not a big believer in time travelers, but for some reason that screams at me as time travel. I don't know why. <laughs> this is like they know they're not supposed to interact. Yeah, it was like his safety. It was like his mechanism for self-destruct. Or it was like he made it go somewhere else. Like it didn't really explode. It just like disappeared. And the only thing they could think of was to say, it, you know, exploded. Yeah, and I've been reading a lot of stuff about dematerializing and possibly different types of aliens having that sort of technology. So that's probably more likely. I just know you're a big fan of the time travel aspect, so I didn't know if that was screaming out to you that way. It actually did not, oddly enough. But also, I read like this giant book that has me pretty convinced now that this is like not not normal things like time travelers. Or oh, are, are are you leaning back my way? I'm leaning hard, man. So awesome. he goes even further back to an event. Mr. Keel oh. was able to do this. Well, I've always, I've always straddled all these different. So, and I'm gonna do a bunch of Keyhole books because this one was good. It is all over the place, so I highly recommend people buy it. Um, it has a ton of stories. I could, I couldn't fit even a twentieth of them in here. So he goes back even further to another event in 1561 in Germany, and this one's very famous. They've talked about it like on the History Channel and stuff, where a number of large plates, uh, so those would be saucers, and giant tubes, so those would be cigar crafts, yeah. glowing, engaged in an aerial dogfight above Nuremberg, Germany, where the population was terrified. Rightfully so. Oh, yeah. that's. I mean, think about it. You think 1870 guy was freaked out. Like, this is... And so this was memorialized in artwork. And Let me imagine that. It's the 1500s. You're a peasant in Germany. Your life expectancy, I'm assuming, is like 35, 40, maybe. And there and is a like, Star Wars battle above your and house. There, and there's uh, plates and baguettes, like, flying at each It's just weird. <laughs> Baguette shape. I didn't even think about that. That's probably is what they would describe it as back then. They described I was it like, what is, what is a cylinder shape? I guess they would have had cigars probably at that point. I'm sure they had tubes. I don't know if tubes had been invented yet. Oh, well, they described it as tubes. Well, that may have been where the idea comes from. I don't know. And so basically he just goes back and back in time and he talks about how there's been UFO sightings and they always seem to contextualize themselves. And he starts by saying that any high school student of physics can tell you that our reality is an illusion. Occultists and the religious have been saying it for centuries. All matter is composed of confined energy, 
tiny moving electrons and energy particles, so tiny that the atom remained only a theory for many years. We cannot see these objects, but we can prove scientifically that they exist and are made up of energy. For instance, the chair you sit on is composed of billions and billions of molecules. Each cell of your body is t each cell of your body is too. And if the patterns and frequencies of these atoms were different, it's conceivable that they would intermix and you would fall right through your chair the way your hand passes through a cloud of cigarette smoke. Weird. Our, well, that's true. Our I know. Reality, I'm just this weird, to think, weird to think about. Our reality is based entirely on what we can perceive with our physical senses, but from radios to other devices, we already know that there are many more waves that we cannot detect with our body. And there are thousands of microscopic life forms in every glass of water you drink. You just don't experience such things without the use of technology. For thousands of years, spiritualists and the religious have talked about auras, frequencies, vibrations, and other planes of existence, each with their own complex vocabulary. And now, the uh, Keel says, I will try to demonstrate that the UFO entities are directly related to the entities and manifestations involved in religious miracles and seances. He starts uh, in 1968 um, when a, this is still during the contactee, contactee era. Um, so he starts with an entity named Mr. Orion who passed a, a message along to a contact of Mr. Kiel's that quote, these saucers, which you speak of are such as such are in reality, the space bodies of certain aggregates of consciousness. They exist duo dimensionally. That is, they penetrate both the third and fourth dimension simultaneously, but can, if they wish, choose to be in one or the other. Their purposes have been and still are for a time being to interlace these two realms of consciousness, which are seemingly separate. And this part freaked me out. However, the time quickly comes when the veil is torn and what is one is perceived as one. It is at that moment that the saucers seen by few will be seen by many. It will appear that they have suddenly arrived in your skies in great number, but in reality, that's untrue. For in reality, they were, and they have always been, here. But man sees only with new eyes. Whoa. So, yeah, I know, that was freaky. I've had some pretty freaky dreams about that day, too. So, like, okay, so Mr. Orion's telling Keel this? So what we're going to find out is that and then, okay, passed it along to a contact. So the contact is now passing it along to Keel. A lot of channelers and people would claim to be basically possessed at this time by these entities. And they would call I mean, him. So we're talking about demons a little bit. A little bit. It's already seeming that way. I mean, that really sounds like some demon stuff. I mean. Basically, like, you only see us when you want us to see you. I'm possessing a person right now. There's going to come a day soon when we're everyone sees us. Yeah, it sounds pretty freaky. That sounds like some demonic demon talking stuff. Like especially possessing people. Like it's one thing like they relate a message. It's another thing to be like, I possess this person. Oh yeah. And he goes into and he goes on. This is kind of the science portion of the book in the beginning where he talks about basically things that are too small for us to see like electromagnetic waves and it really had me thinking of like string theory that we had discussed in a couple episodes um it's been an example of like small dimensions that exist all around us uh but basically um our lack of being able to experience these things is the veil is his theory that mystics have talked about for ages okay so he goes on to discuss um skin burns and other effects of ultraviolet radiation that um, his witness, numerous of his witnesses and in, uh, interviews with abductees have experienced. And uh, he's existed many, he's interviewed many people shortly after sighting who had their eyes swollen from bright light and electromagnetic, electromagnetic waves, which mm. makes me think of your police officer. Yeah, the 79 uh, blinded by the light. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also, no, that's a that's a thing. I believe uh, Moses too had a his face was burnt after Mount Sinai. Um, I don't know. I, we don't have I, to get to that. I I specifically kept the Bible stuff out of this one because everyone's heard that. Everyone's like, oh, it's aliens. That'll be its own thing maybe someday, but I doubt it. 
Is there something about his face showing bright afterwards or something? I'm trying to think of what it is. Yeah, that's what it was that was basically glowing. And some people have said, oh, that's radiation. Oh, that's, you know, which, you know, who knows? So So maybe God radiated Moses a little bit and that's what gave him the go, I guess. I don't know. That's that's okay. But uh, more or less. And also I, I thought about like the burns and fields where there's UFO landings. They'll be like those perfect circles and stuff. Um, he notes that we, quote, have a considerable body of evidence that these objects, UFOs, appear to be transparent when they want to be, even though they appear to be mechanical. And he recounts a family interviewed in Florida in 1968 that went outside when their dog was howling and saw a transparent red object, a 30-foot sphere, with two men inside and a strong stench of ammonia radiating in their yard. The family and other witnesses at a nearby schoolyard watched as it ascended into the sky. And he asks, is this a spaceship? And decides that it's not very likely um, because, and as we'll get into, a lot of times with these so-called ships, there's really nothing to them. Like in this one, you could just kind of see the hollow outline of red, and there's just two guys standing there. And he describes them operating what sounded like a pump, like a water pump or something. (laughs) And when they finished, it shot up in the air like a UFO. And there are... What? Yes. And a big theme of this book is that a lot of the UFO encounters you hear have these There's strange... There's a pump involved? They have these, like, really bizarro aspects to them. But nobody talks about those parts because they... they sound even crazier than the UFO they sound, part to begin with. Right. They sound even crazier than they... Then they began, but he was really good at getting like the full story out of people. So he would go to investigate stuff that was in newspapers or people would contact him and say, there's 30 witnesses of UFO. And he would really drill down and he would find that other people just wouldn't report this weirdness aspect, which started to drive him a little bit nuts. Not literally nuts, but it started to, you know, make him wonder why he's the only person that's seeing this. And so there's many other bewildering accounts of shell like red, red glowing ball. Two guys Trans- inside. Transparent. Pump, take off into the air. Yes. I mean, that sounds like some sort of an amusement park ride, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. And there's this aspect of, like, they want to be seen, and it's, like, always weird. You know what I mean? Like, why were they hovering like, outside this person? voyeuristic. Like, like. Yeah, just to, like, confuse people. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's annoying. So he mentions that there are many uh, accounts of shell-like objects with no visual means of propulsion or, in fact, technology of any kind. A witness who was invited on board a saucer in Nebraska in 1957 noticed, for instance, that nobody walked in the saucer. They all just hovered or glided. And other witnesses have seen UFO knots fly to their ship or walk through the walls as if they were ghosts. And notes that if they are machines... And this I found really interesting. He Keel says, if they're machines, why do they keep? Why do they always seem to be falling apart? Like there's so many instances, um, even going back to the 1800s, of aliens like repairing their craft, or there'd be a crash, or somebody would come upon it, or, and there'd be like pieces dropping off of it, like random chunks of metal. And it just seems very odd that if this, this is advanced technology, why is it always breaking down? Why is it always dropping little trinkets? I mean. That seems weird, but talk to anybody that's owned, like, a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or, like, their supercars, they break down a lot. Like, yeah. nobody talks about that, but... Right, I get you. And I'm not saying that's what this is, but, I mean, if it flew across galaxies, I could maybe see it needing some repairs. Yeah, but do they have to get out and like use like weird wrenches on it? And like, I don't know. It just seems. I get what I get what you're saying for something that seems very smooth and to not really have many parts. What are they working on? Right, and when so just... much stuff is just like done like te- uh, telepathically and whatnot. Yeah, he seems to be coming to the conclusion that these things are more phantom than they are like real object. And this reminds me actually, there's a uh, Joe Rogan where he talks to that area 51 scientist, Bob Lazar. And mm-hmm. one thing that's always stuck out with me in that is Bob Lazar says that the, one of the things the scientists can't figure out is that there seem to be like no moving parts to this thing. It, yeah. They can't figure out what actually controls it. And this, this reminds me of, I was looking for the word last week when we were talking about this, but, um, 
for one, in the Rendlesham Forest incident in the UK, where basically these UFOs did this really weird stuff, um, we'll have to do an episode of this, to a nuclear, basically a nuclear weapon site. There's mm-hmm. lots of reports of like poltergeist activity, and they would report like small metal spheres dropping out of the ground right next to them when they'd be in the forest, and just like dropping this, out of the sky. You mean the dropping out of the ground. sky? Yeah, like oh, okay. things, like in midday they'd go out to like investigate the scene, and they'd be like just looking around for like marks on the grass, and just like a metal ball would just like fall out of nowhere and just like land near them. And this is actually a common thing in poltergeist activity it's called a ports and it happens during seances and it happens with poltergeists where like basically small trinkets will manifest and i kind of wonder this isn't kill but i've wondered based on the a port theory and based on this whole bob lazar saying they can't figure out what the actual technology is i kind of wonder if maybe some of these ufos aren't giant a ports it's Mm. just a giant metal object and it doesn't fly with technology just flies you know and yeah, we're getting into weird stuff. It's just beginning. Flies by the spirit, essentially. Essentially, yeah. The spirit's out moving around, and it's in this giant a- airport, uh, a port, just to mess with us. Okay. So he te- he goes on to tell like a bunch more stories of like these things being more like ethereal lights than anything. He tells one story of red lights that followed a new. This sounds a lot like your Minnesota guy. Um, of red lights that followed a New York woman home in 1967. The woman at first thought it was a police car, but then when she glanced over, she saw an eerie illuminated flying object traveling just beside her along power lines. At the Whoa. same moment, yeah. <laughs> at the same moment that she noticed it, she became horrified to find that she could no longer control her automobile. And her young son appeared to be in a trance not even responding to her yelling at him because she's freaking out. She's not in control of this car, and it's driving itself. It's at this point that the car pulled itself over to the shoulder of the road. A white beam of light flashed down from the object. She heard a hum and then voices, a strange chorus of many voices. She became hysterical as her son remained in a trance. And what did the voices tell her? They began to describe someone the woman knew and told her that her friend had just been in an accident many miles away. It also said that her son would not remember any of this. She was then given control of the car as the object vanished. The next day, the woman learned that the voices had been telling the truth. And she went to the media outlets with this. Um, Keel, in fact, notes that a large number of UFO encounters seem to happen when children are present and trances are common. And that the seizure of control of vehicles is also common as well. And that this particular case was highly credible and reported in multiple media outlets at the time and all the reporters found it credible. So Keel asks, if this is true, as well as the many other interviews he has done, why do these beings seem to know so much about people's lives? Man, that's just, you're driving down the road and a, you remember when we were on the phone that one time and there was like a green light like up in the sky and I followed it for a while and it just took off and disappeared. I can only imagine if that thing had like slowed down, gotten closer to me and then like taking control of the car. Like, Oh yeah. That'd be terrifying. I'd jump out of my car if I could. I'd be like, (sighs) bye. I guess she couldn't because she had her son with her. Well, you can have more kids. (laughs) Bye little Johnny. Good luck buddy. Tuck and roll. No. uh, Yeah. That, and then your kid's in a trance, too. Like, that's just scary on so many different levels all at once. And then to essentially get a prophecy from, like, yeah. this chorus of voices and this light coming down from the sky. And then what do you do with that information? She didn't do anything with it. She went well, home. I she mean, like, she husband. couldn't have done anything. But, like, it's just, like, some random thing told me a thing that happened at, like, exactly the same time. But I couldn't have saved my friend. Like, it didn't do anything. I don't even know what this is proving to me, really. All it did, and this is kind of his theory, and we'll get into it, all it did was basically do something that proved to her, it set up a narrative for her. Yeah. That I had this experience, it was with these beings. Does and something it, else happen to her? No, is not she that I know. Around? No, she's not. See, that's what I was, I'm always waiting for with stuff like that, is like, okay, so they proved themselves as knowing things 
I, why don't we? Hear, I'm just confused. Why don't we hear about them like coming back around for these people? Well, like that seems. I know that happens, but yeah, it's just I don't know. Yeah, it's very weird. And so that you know that if that happened a hundred years ago, and we didn't have this whole alien hypothesis, that would just be like an angel or something talking to you or yeah. a demon. So there's also other spiritual as- aspects. Uh, Keel notes that the famed researcher Charles Fort author of the Book of the Damned, noted that in 1846, real blood reigned over numerous cities in the world in several areas accompanied by odd lights and shape in the sky. That year, a glowing disc descended over France and told witnesses, quote, numerous prophecies that ended up being accurate. I know. Okay. Yeah, that was a rough year, 1846. (laughs) You have blood, UFOs. And so at this point, he returns to the airships in the 1890s, um, and he describes that flap as pretty much the moment that the, quote, secret of the UFOs should be exposed as a deception. The flap began Christmas week of 1896, when numerous people in California reported egg-shaped craft weaving weaving and bobbing throughout the sky as if on yo-yo strings. And that's your Tic Tacs, my friend. Yep. These stories ended up happening all across the country in hundreds of reports that have been unveil- been unveiled by historians. Witnesses include prominent members of communities and leaders who signed affidavits. And there's so much of these that if you actually add them up, um, and media was slower back then, but if you go through the records and you add them up, there basically was like an armada of this fleet over the United States at this time, something that would cause mass panic today. Um and it has all these hallmarks of this weird stuff. Weird wheels, like metal wheels, would fall out of the sky. Um, sometimes the ships would land, and uh, the occupants would ask people to help them repair the ships. Um, one of the most documented encounters actually happened in Vernon, Kansas, where a farmer and his family saw a 300-foot-long cigar-shaped craft hover over their home. And he could hear the inhabitants inside speaking. And here's where it gets really weird. The men in the cigar-shaped craft dropped a rope down, lassoed one of his calves, and then started pulling it up into the UFO. Cowboy aliens? Like, they cowboyed his alien. And he's like, wait, wait, wait. And he runs over, and he's, like, struggling to free it. But they're, like, pulling their rope, and he's, like, trying to pull the calf down. And they, like, outstrength him, and they, like, pull the calf up and just, like, fly away with this calf, like, hanging by a rope. Were blimps a thing at this time? Um... I think some primitive, like hot air balloons and blimps were yet. That but this is not. sounds like some cattle rustlers got a hold of a blimp and were trying something. A 300 foot long. Look, I don't know how big blimps are. There's a football yeah. field. That seems that like. Aren't, bi- yeah, aren't blimps like that big? Yeah, I don't know if they had ones that big at this time. I don't know. That's a good theory, actually. Um. But again, this is one. Of... I mean, this is just weird, though. And yeah, I. It does. I. I'm already leaning towards a spiritual aspect to a lot of this stuff. I'm not saying all of it, but that almost sounds like something wanting to do something that is relatable to the person they're messing with. That's a big, you nailed it. They are. And uh, a big part of this book is that they always present themselves as something relatable. It's just beyond their technology, but it's something you can kind of wrap your head around. Well, except for the people seeing discs in, like, the 1500s flying around, like... And that, basically, the way he explains that is that they just outright explain themselves as, like, spiritual entities when they had to. Or that they... uh, And I think that happened a lot. Yeah. Or they ran into the woods and their uh, ship glitter bombed itself. Even more disturbing, I found, from this 1890s encounters, were the descriptions of the inhabitants of the craft. They're almost universally described as dour men who travel in threes with high cheekbones, wearing somber, somber dark clothing, olive complexion, and oriental eyes. That sound familiar, man? Yeah. That's men in black, dude. A little bit, yeah. So Kiel then goes on to explain something in ufology called the, quote, Wednesday phenomenon, which is that a high amount of sightings seem to happen on Wednesdays and Saturdays. He discovered this pattern himself by combing through years of research, but it's also been observed by many other uh, researchers for a long time before Kiel. 
In Myth and Legend of Ancient Israel by Angelio Rappaport, there's a segment entitled Concerning Demons, stating that Wednesdays and Saturdays are the most common times for demon encounters in Jewish mythology. And he points to the demon Agrath, who, quote, commands hosts of evil spirits and demons that ride in big chariots in the skies. In a report in 1875 at a prayer meeting in London, Ontario, Canada, on a Wednesday, parishioners reported seeing a beautiful light from heaven, brighter than the sun at midday, that came down with a mighty rushing wind as it reached the place where they stood. A beautiful light shot down on them, described, and they described the light as, quote, just as bright on the inside edge as it was at the center, and just as dark on the outer edge as miles away. And that's basically a directed energy. That's what people describe with UFOs is this perfect light that's like a shaft. It's just like, you know, it's a shaft of light where it's almost like a light object. Yeah. Um, so that's just like many modern UFO encounters. And Keel notes that the amusing little mystery of flying saucers slowly evolved into a complicated series of coincidences and paradoxes. The deeper we plunge into the data, he says, our skies are filled with, quote, Trojan horses with hostile intent. They prefer thinly populated areas where it will be difficult to be detected, and they choose to appear in various forms, from dirigibles to airships to even false airplanes. And he has an entire chapter on false airplanes. That's weird. In really? short, Yeah. In short, they are deceptive. So looking at phenomenon holistically, it appears that flying saucers, as part of this bigger picture, are a deceptive part, and that they're not all what some scientists hope they are going to be. They are something else, something Keel calls Operation Trojan Horse. Okay. He says they're constantly reaching down to us in frames of reference we can accept from religious to technological so that the first step to getting to the bottom of this is to disregard all of our frames of reference. And he traces all of this from religious stuff to airships to the airplanes. And then after 1947, and then in 1947, after the war, um, it slowly became more technological, which is what we see with UFOs. Yeah. It's then in 1947 that Operation Trojan Horse changed its route. And the, quote, great flying saucer frame of reference was carefully built up. And there he's referencing, he keeps talking about frames of references, which is exactly what you said earlier. They're always trying to frame the encounters in a certain way. Yeah. Which appears to be the only reason they do some contacts at all is just to say, hello, we're aliens, goodbye. Yeah, which is, those are the weirdest ones where I'm like, why? Why? Yeah, well, they do it apparently just to build a mythology. They want us to know. Now, they're not going to show themselves, you know what I mean? But they're going to show themselves to enough people so that we know. This is a really weird, I don't know. Yeah, it just speaks to That's always people. bothered me. I'm like, so you want attention, but not that much. You kind of want to make the people that know about you seem crazy. I don't know. Right. It's all these mixed motives. There's a lot of mixed messages going on. And he says that basically whatever these entities are have carefully built up the UFO story in a series of spectacular incidents and contacts the whole structure of which carefully followed the psychological conditioning of the earlier flaps. After 1947, what he describes as the cults, the UFO cults, sprang up attempting to explain the phenomenon as technology from a superior race. They labored to prove the reliability of witnesses and the search for physical evidence, but this posed a problem because if a piece of evidence, say a piece of metal out of the sky, proved to be aluminum, then how could you say it's from the entities? But if it was some kind of strange new material, how could you even trust that either? And this is what Kiel calls the artifact or hardware game, which, ironically enough, is a game well-known in Irish fairy folklore, where fairies are well-known for planting fake physical evidence to drive experiencers mad and into confusion. Really? Yeah, yeah. So the people stuck on the physical craft hypothesis are stuck with two options. Either a craft makes an error and crashes, and this supposedly has happened at Roswell, but we have no idea of knowing what the government's collected or if it's been of any use. Or two, the UFO knots ex um, must land themselves in some public space. Uh, this only seems to happen in remote locations, and almost every encounter seems to be to advance a narrative and set a frame of reference. So 
Keel's criterion or solution to this problem is basically um, the first step is to look at when two things happen miles or years apart and are very similar. And that instead of saying this is an angel, this is a UFO, just look at what's similar. So he tells a story from 1897 in Texas where an airship was seen dragging an anchor through a town until it got caught on a railroad. It's then that a man in a blue sailor suit came down a rope, cut the anchor off, and sailed away. This anchor is at a museum to this day, by the way. What? This was seen by hundreds of people. Yeah, but again, the problem is, let's say this is true, it's an anchor. What are you going to do? I mean, you can't, there's yeah. no, other than the eyewitnesses, they left, it's like to drive you crazy. So, like, let's say you really did witness this and you had the anchor. How do you explain to someone, other than we saw it, we saw it, we saw it, which is the same thing you'd say without evidence. They just say, well, that's, yeah. a, that's an anchor. You could get that from anywhere. You almost look crazier with the anchor. You look crazier. They're trying to drive people crazy. And, like, the mayor and stuff is attesting to this. Like, good faith people are like, we saw this ship. This anchor is from this ship. He then points to, and this is a joke they like to play, apparently. He pokes, he points to an ancient Irish manuscript from 956 AD when on a Sunday, while people were at Mass, a metal anchor dropped from the sky outside of the church, and one of the sharp edges caught the door of the church. People rushed outside to see what was going on, and a man jumped from the craft and appeared to be swimming down to the anchor as if he was swimming in water. Numerous people freaking out tried to grab him, but the bishop forbade it because he was scared the man would hurt one of them. The man came down, cut the rope, swam back up to his ship, and sailed away through the skies. And this anchor is also still on display at that church in Ireland. How do they explain it? I don't think the church has. I think they're just like, this is a thing that happened. We just keep it around now for traditions. Like, I got, man, this is weird. <laughs> the same thing happened. In Wait, the there's church. another ship incident? Yep. The same okay. thing happened in Bristol, England in 1200 AD uh, in a church that has a unique grill on its door that's made from an anchor where the same thing happened in 1200 AD. And the same thing happened in another location in 1897 in Iowa. So... Now, two of these happened in the airship flap. Two of them are from an ancient rare manuscript that's unlikely that these people knew about it in, like, Iowa and Texas in 1897. And this yeah. Phenom- yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he notes that this phenomenon of just bizarre things being dropped from ships is actually goes back to Rome, where there are stories of stone pillars weighing hundreds of pounds or giant blocks of ice dropping from the sky. To this day... Now, fly uh, saucers are still seem to be dropping things. Uh, Bits of magnesium, aluminum, uh, plain old tin. There's also sites, uh, he also cites a story from Brazil in 1954 when hundreds of people witnessed a streaming silverly liquid coming from a craft. And I tried to Google this, and I can't believe I didn't find this for headlines. This also happened in Colombia last week. Columbia, the country? Yeah. They filmed a video of a UFO with what appeared to be some kind of liquid coming from it. And the same thing happened in Brazil in 1950. Great. The aliens are chemtrailing us now? They're doing something, man. Cool. He notes that mysterious hollow spheres have also dropped out of the sky, including some investigated by Australian scientists in 1963 who were baffled. He's so got more of the metal balls falling. It's metal balls. Sometimes they're very big, too. They're like oh, very scary. large hollow metal balls. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so these are just examples of airports, basically. He summarizes at one point all the things that dropped during the flaps in the 1890s. There was like times when the airship would go by and they would throw out like potatoes and newspapers. And then sometimes like weird messages and like prophecies and stuff. And he and he says that um, in the eighteen seven in the eight nineteen uh, sorry the eighteen nineties um, all of these sightings seem to support the quote secret innovator myth. So they appeared basically as these men in black, but they were very 
much trying to make people see them as like secret geniuses or secret inventors. They weren't trying to be like alien. They were trying to be like, oh, I'm an eccentric inventor. And we know, as a matter of fact, there was not giant airships like this that secret inventors had at this time. That threw out potatoes and... Yeah, just... And again, that's a total poltergeist thing. Um, today, it seems to be strange goo and metals uh, that support the space people myth. Like the goo that was in the basement at the Amon's Demon House. Oh, I didn't even think about goo being... In... Yeah, goo is a poltergeist thing. Mm-hmm. And among the most unreported of strange UFO cases are the, quote, many people accounts. And many is, like, many, M-I-N-I. -I. Oh, yeah, I follow you. I, I've been down a hole on this subject very <laughs> recently. Go ahead. And these Go are ahead. more common than you might think. Well, I guess yes. you would now since you, uh, but they're hardly reported, again, because people don't want to seem nuts, and they're very similar to fairy tales. People yes. often report seeing miniature flying saucers, some flying around their homes. One of like the kazoo from the Flintstones. Yeah, exactly. It's, it sounds exactly like kazoo. Uh, one of the strangers was in Seattle, Washington in 1965 when a woman awoke at 2 a.m. to find that she was paralyzed. Suddenly, a tiny football-sized doll gray object flew in her window and hovered near her bed. This is why you don't leave your windows open at night, especially with no screen, like just letting bugs and everything in your life. Oh, the 60s were weird, man. I know. How, did, how was everybody not just bitten up by mosquitoes all the time? Like, they didn't have screens on windows and stuff. People just leaving windows open all the time. Maybe they were, although this was in Seattle. I live a very tormented life. I, I hate bugs, man. I never open a window. Not without a screen, especially. It's just, anyway. And the kazoo thing is perfect, because basically what happens in the story is, literally, a little tripod comes out from the bottom of this craft. It lands. Five little men come out in helmets. Five uh, of they, them fit in there. Five little men come out. They do some repairs with, like, little wrenches and stuff. And then they uh, fly off. And that's when she's free to move. Ooh. Uh, so, of course, people aren't going to tell these stories because you'll look nuts. Well, yeah, you're going to get accused of, like, lucid dreaming or... Right. I don't know. I mean, ugh, I don't know. That's weird. And so, again, he finds that what he calls a UFO organization cultist kind of refuse to fully report stories like this. Um, or they will report a UFO story, but they'll leave out the weird details like or simply ignore them. Like the aliens were three inches tall. Right. It's like, because um, Kiel would find, you know, you have this report, he'd go out and it'd be like really freaking weird. But his theory is basically that these, a lot of these UFO organizations are basically cultists. They have their theory. They're like, this is aliens. This is technology. So they just ignore everything that doesn't go with that theory. Yeah, I am finding that a lot. Um, the farther we go into this and reading other people's research and everything, it. It seems like, yeah, a lot of people, when you start reading multiple things that they do, everybody wants to jam it into their square peg or circle peg, whatever whatever hole they have. They're trying to put everything through that. Right. And so Kiel's philosophy was throw all that out, just listen to the witnesses, and report what they say, just as they say it. And so that's why he got such great stuff. Um. So Keel concludes at this part of the book that the statistical data that he's collected indicates that UFOs are not stable machines, and they are, in all probability, some sort of transmogrification of energy and do not exist in the same way that the chair you sit on exists. They are not, quote, permanent constructions of matter. What's more, the messages... Uh, to contactees are almost identical to messages long received by mediums and mystics. In November of 1966, he reports an odd encounter with two women in Awatona, Minnesota. Uh, one of them will call Miss Butler. It was her home. Man, Minnesota was having a rough time in the 60s. I know. And Kansas and Texas were getting it in the 1800s. They, they just like to... They pick a spot and then they hang out there for a little while, it seems like. Yeah, Kill calls them windows. He says they seem to like, and I don't know if it's like they have a way in through our dimension, like at certain portals or whatever, but he says they tend to flare up in one place and okay. just do all their stuff at once. So Miss Butler and a friend were outside watching stars when suddenly a brilliant object came out of the sky and approached them. 
They described it as having many colored lights flickering around a glowing rim. Suddenly, a strange metallic voice came from the craft. What is your time cycle? The voice asked. Butler's friend was in the trance, but she uh, began to just, this was so bizarre, she just was like, took its orders and she started trying to explain she's like well there's minutes and like a minute is 60 seconds and 60 minutes is an hour and 24 hours is a day and the voice interrupts her and says what constitutes a day what constitutes a night and then she starts trying to explain that she's like well there's like 12 hours in a day but it's mainly it's like when the sun's up and like the nights when the sun's down and then the voice just stops and shoots away and her friend comes out of the trance and says i'm glad that's over what <laughs> it's just bizarre and so the woman's friend goes home miss butler's friend goes home and following this miss butler starts experiencing blinding headaches whenever she tries to discuss the incident which is common with uh demon experiences she reports that in early 1967 so just like a month later a month or two later, a man came to her home identifying himself as an Air Force officer. Total men in black. Guys in a like brand new gray suit. His hair is too long. He's got that olive complexion. At one point, the man said his stomach was hurting. He might have been mimicking her because she was also experiencing a lot of like pain and stomach issues at this point. And so she said, well, I'll make you some Jello. I guess in the 60s, Jello was to soothe your stomach. It does help. Um, and then she stops her interview with Kiel and she asks him, have you ever heard of someone trying to drink a jello? And he says, what? She says, so the air force officer picked up the bowl I gave him, ignored the spoon and began trying to drink it out of the bowl. And in fact, well, that's she a frustrating endeavor. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's like, the, so the air it's force just officer... hitting me in the face. The Air Force officer is confused. He's like, he probably is like, what is this matter? Uh, and she had to teach him how to use a spoon well, the whole time he was like confused. Oh, man, with... that's some serious Men in Black stuff. Remember when we talked about that? Like, they're, oh, they're yeah. not good at using, like, cutlery. Like, they cutlery. Utensils. I kind of wonder if it's, you know how, like, in fairy legends, how they say not to eat their food? Yeah. I kind of wonder if they're also not supposed to eat our food. And maybe that's, like, a weird excuse they use. Like, they don't know how to decline. Like, they don't want to be rude, but they also, like, will do anything not to eat the food. So this guy's like, what? what? She's like, no, use the spoon. He's like, I, you know what I mean? Like, maybe they know how to use a spoon, but they're just like. Uh, but... but they're very polite, I think, is the main takeaway from this. They're extremely polite. Right. <laughs> <laughs> But more troublingly, uh, oh, by the way, the Air Force guy was asking her about UFOs. So it's, oh, a yeah. class, it's a classic Men in Black encounter. So the Air Force guy leaves, and shortly after this, Butler begins experiencing poltergeist activity in her house. Objects moving on their own, glass objects shattering without any cause, strange noises, and people walking around. Well, the time to burn this house down. Oh, yeah. It's like, what a weird way to start it, too. Like, what is your timeline? And then on the next thing you know, you have ghosts. That's so weird. And this is when he really starts to drawing connections. In a chapter entitled Cosmic Jokers, Keel states that demonology, in his opinion, is not a crackpotology. It's an ancient and scholarly study of monsters and demons who have coexisted with humanity since the beginning. And he notes that well-known documented demonic events are often identified to identical to UFO phenomenon. Demons are said to appear as whatever they want to, from angels of lights to horrifying monsters. And they can materialize and dematerialize at will, walk through walls, etc., just like the UFO occupants. Quote, the devil's emissaries of yesteryear are now the men in black. Quasi-angels of biblical time are magnificent spacemen or long-haired Venusians. In the Forgotten Books of Eden, an apocryphal book that's ancient but is left out of the Bible, we are told that Satan and his hosts are fallen angels who populated Earth before Adam was brought into being, and that Satan used lights and fire, similar to UFOs, to scare us from the planet. And subtle versions of this same theme can be found in numerous ancient manuscripts um, of cultures all across the world. 
In short, ancient people always seemed to believe that the other dimensional beings inhabited this planet before us, and the conflict between physical man and the otherworldly was inevitable. The records of demonology are filled with striking parallels to the parapsychological aspect of UFO encounters. And often UFO encounters seem to be as much in the mind of the witnesses as some sort of psychic projection. Witnesses of vampires in the Middle Ages were often paralyzed, and the description of vampires um, that we have historically are near identical to the men in black, right down to uh, the clothing and oriental-like faces. And everybody knows vampires can't use forks very well at all, so... No, that's why they just frustratingly... <laughs> that's why they just bite people, I mean... They just get mad. They're just like, I can't use a fork. And they bite you. Yep. In the 1950s, Albert Bender, a man who dabbled in black magic and UFOlogy, created a stir. Man, that's a resume. Yeah, and that's kind of a not too uncommon of a thing for people that are interested in one to be interested in the other. I am finding that the further we go into this show. I guess we could be counted as that, too, even though we're we not. We are kind of that. We're just, yeah. Yeah, I guess you're right. We are that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we are that. Unlike us, Bender uh, decided to dabble in black magic. Yeah. Um, no, that's not us, yeah. And at one point, he was visited by three men with glowing eyes dressed in black suits. Hmm. This he is the suffered... 50s? Yep, this is the 50s. Man, the men in black were just busy from like the 40s until like the 80s just hardcore just out there pressing the flash i know what happened they're always changing up their game though and i mean there's still we still hear i mean when we covered them we still hear stuff about them now but it's not it doesn't seem like the level that was going on back then no seemed like like a good majority of the people that were having experiences in that time frame a good, good chunk of them were getting contacted by the men in black during that, or immediately after. I almost wonder, though, how many reporters now, like a guy like John Kill, really exist anymore? Like, who is really on the ground going to locations, That's true. doing witness interviews? It's almost like we just rely on the internet. And these people aren't going to tell their own story. I mean, you know, you might rush to a message board or something to do it secretly, but if you're just like a normal housewife and you have a UFO ask you how time works and then a minute well, black that comes well this should be a good time to bring up that if you have a ufo story and you're out there or an or a contact demon story us. contact us go to the website right. there's a contact form there uh the email is uh cryptic a podcast at gmail but yeah reach out to us because that's not actually something new that's coming with this show uh where we want to start doing interviews for people that have actually had experiences oh yeah maybe we'll so a weird place to plug it there in the middle of the show but i was thinking about it so Hey, man. We want to be an outlet for that. We want to be an wanna, outlet for that. We want to quit our jobs and become John Keel. That, I mean, yeah. That'd be the life, man. Although, <laughs> when we get into some of the next stuff, you might not want to. <laughs> no, so, I think I'm in. I, I realize we're we're knocking on the door of some pretty scary stuff, but I think I'm, I'm down to go find out. Oh, I'm down, too. And so, as expected, Bender, actually, this is really weird, he just up and quit after, he just completely quit after he saw the men, um, partially because they scared the heck out of him, uh, partially because he, again, got horrible headaches afterward whenever he'd get into the subject, which is common with UFOlogy and demonology. Hmm. Um, Kill describes that many of his friends, um, including himself, would be trailed by black Cadillacs lacks that would disappear suddenly. Uh, uh, people would become obsessed with the occult or commit suicide, among many other encounters and misfortunes. And mm. then there's the phenomenon he calls time compression, where people re report uh, spending a long time, even hours, with the entities where only a bit of time has passed in the real world. This is common in fairy folklore as well. In the contactee era, he reports that many people would quit their jobs and devote their life to alternative spirituality or to investigating what had happened to them uh, full time. And that can be common after uh, demonic experiences as well. He says it's as if these entities have the power to possess the human mind and that we have no way of knowing what type of widespread programming could be lying dormant in the minds of people. Suppose the plan is to process millions of people and then some future date trigger all their minds at the same 
time. Which, uh, in my mind, brings to mind some of that scary stuff we had way back in our, like, sexual, demonic, UFO encounter hybrid stuff. The idea oh, the, the human hybrid theory episode? Yeah. The idea or the alien hybrid. Awesome. Alien hybrid theory. Sorry. Abducting, like, millions of people and, like, programming them for some future event where they would, like, help out at the end of the world or whatever. Huh. And cool. at this point in the book, he'll starts to get personal he moves on to describe the summer of 1966 when he witnessed several ufos himself while on the trails of his research and he was also trailed by black cadillacs as well and around this time he began receiving numerous phone calls from strangers um and he was only about a year into being a full-time researcher at this point um the strangers would call him even when he was staying at hotels or places he didn't normally stay what he does not say in the book is that at this at this time he was actually doing the Mothman um, research in Point Pleasant, Virginia, um, and the Mothman, for those of you who don't know, will be its own show eventually. It's this. I think we we I think we've talked about it a couple times and how we were going to do it at some point. Maybe that's just us talking personally. I don't know if it was actually on the show, but I know we've talked about how that's something we're going to talk about at some point. Oh, it's coming. And if you don't know, it's this demonic winged creature that kind of messed with this town from November of 1966 um, to a certain date in December of 1967. And Keel himself was followed by numerous luminous objects in this year that seemed to be ominous. He was trailed by cars that disappeared down dead end alleyways. He witnessed poltergeist activities in the apartments, uh, the smell of hydrogen sulfide, and witnessed one woman uh, who had a two-hour mental breakdown, or what we might call possession, by the entities. And Keel was hardcore questioning his own sanity at this time, but he just kept on working, and he just kept on taking notes. Like, this is what this guy does, so... You wake up in the morning, you get a call from a weird voice in New York, and it's telling you that the Pope's going to get shot. You just, like, take out your notepad, write it down. Honestly, you, these things on. might be calling me, and I'm just sending them to voicemail. Can you imagine the time when you just answered your phone? Just I know. Without, without thought, without question, just, well, the phone's ringing. Somebody wants to talk to me. Hello, is this my wake-up call? I yeah. am from Dimension X. <sighs> And he was getting these from strangers. He would also get these from contactees who would be claiming to basically be talking for the aliens. Yes. Um, yeah, hundreds of these calls. People calling from all across the country claiming to be possessed by these entities. Um, or that there, there was a UFO right then and right there telling them things. Often he would get phone calls from opposite sides of the country that would predict the same event. There was a huge prophetic uh, element to some of these calls. Man, how do you weed through the fake so? Because you know some of them are going to be fake. Well, he said he developed a really meticulous method, which I won't go through. Well, basically, he would just take down everything, and then, you know, what happened, happened. Um, but he would also kind of get to know who were the pranksters and who weren't. Yeah, and I'm sure there's certain tells, and by you can yeah. hear emotion in people's voices. And I didn't take notes on it, but he goes in like quite some detail. He had to develop a, a strategy of like what was important and what wasn't. Um, and so this started in late summer, going into the fall of uh, of 1967, um, and in this short time frame, the voices accurately predicted two plane crashes including one with, like, tremendous detail of an airplane hitting a shopping center in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, it, pred it predicted a surprise visit by the Pope to Turkey, somewhere he had not been for a while. It predicted an earthquake and a location of the earthquake. And it oddly predicted a blizzard hitting the Navajo Indian Reservation, which ended up happening that winter. Whoa. In fact, he says that as time went on, he became better at weeding out the bad ones. There was this particular stretch in late 1967 where everything the callers were telling him were becoming true, which was very troubling because by December, there were only two more predictions that had not come known um, at this point in time. And one was that something would happen 
when President Johnson turned on the Christmas tree lights at the televised White House Christmas special. Man, that's a weird one. Like, why can't you just tell me what's going to happen? Like, why why the yeah. mystery? Like, you know what it is. Well, he strongly assumed it would be a power outage, like a major power outage that would cause deaths. Um, because, you know, back then, you know, it's very cold. Yeah. And in fact, multiple people, he spread the word on that one because this is the big one. Like, this is like... Um, of the two predictions, he saw this one as the bigger one, that there was going to be some kind of national emergency when he turned on the lights. Um, so he assumed this would be a major blackout, told almost everyone he knew. He stocked up on batteries and stuff. The second one was that there would be a disaster along the Ohio River in which many people would drown. Um, and so these were the only two left, um, as he was getting like mid December. So he's like, all right, in two weeks, I guess there's going to be a drowning and there's going to be this major blackout. So on December 15th, 1967, uh, the calendar was set for the lighting of the white house Christmas tree. The first of kills, uh, two predictions kill had his TV on. He like stocked up on flashlights and batteries and like food and stuff. And like a bunch of his friends did too, um, President Johnson went to flick the switch, turned on the Christmas light, and nothing happened. Hmm. He was completely wrong. Everything went as scheduled, turned on the Christmas lights, but uh, no national power outage. Everything's fine. But 30 seconds after the tree was lit up, the news went to a special news alert bulletin. They interrupted the White House broadcast, and a news van came on the TV. Special report, quote, a bridge between Galapagos, Ohio, and West Virginia has just collapsed. It was heavily laden with rush hour traffic. No further details yet. And that was the silver bridge collapse where 75 vehicles went down and 46 people drowned in the river. I'm at, assuming that was the Ohio River. That was the Ohio River. Oh, and so, it, ha it happened during the White House broadcast. So, uh, so basically, the two predictions were one prediction. Yeah, it was just gonna happen when. Right. That's weird. Okay. So, so the one about the bridge, he'd be like, "Well, when? I don't know when." And then the other one, he knew exactly when, but he didn't know what. Well, it turned out he was being told exactly when and exactly what. Man, this is just really making me think even more so than I kind of already did, that fortune tellers are really just talking to, like, demons. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and that they I, kind of make things happen so that they can do things like that to make it look like it was predicted. Oh, and remember when I said that the uh, Mothman happened from a certain date to a certain date? Yeah, was it a Wednesday and a Saturday? Uh, I don't know, actually. But the last day of the Mothman was December 15th, when the bridge fell, all the sightings stopped. That was the culmination, and it was in Wait, the Wait, Mothman was going on at the same time? Yep, in this area, in Point Pleasant, where this bridge collapsed. And the day of the bridge collapse, that's why it's called the Mothman Prophecies. He didn't talk fully about the whole Mothman thing until like five years later in this book, but this is his first description, and in the movie, that's the movie culminates in the bridge collapse. Whoa. So he was investigating this demon bird thing, getting these weird calls from all across the country, and it prophesied the exact time and date of this like bridge collapse. It was crazy. It is huh. crazy. And so that's like the second to last chapter. And the last chapter he goes into basically his, he kind of reiterates everything and he talks about how he feels like there's this, um, the entities are kind of like playing. John Keel also coined the term men in black. And he talks about how the government and the entities basically are going back and forth deceiving each other. So, like, the men in black are trying to look like government agencies, and sometimes the government's trying to look like the men in black. And he goes through, like, some Project Blue Book stuff that talks about how, like, the vast majority of these things they actually can't explain. And yeah. how, like, some people in the military are like, just don't talk about this. Like, if maybe if we don't talk about it, it'll go away. And just kind of reiterating his theory that there's something more supernatural going on here than just, like, aliens. 
And yeah. that's my uh, book report of John Kill's Operation Trojan Horse. That was really good. That was really, really interesting. I've actually been poking around at kind of similar ideas in different ways to the spiritual element to all of it more and more, which we've already, we've kind of been yeah, talking I about like through this whole show. This. Oh, totally, yeah. I feel like I would never get tired of talking about that aspect. But the farther and farther I go, I'm just like, yeah, I'm not saying they're all spirits, but it seems like a lot of these things are some sort of interdimensional spiritual being. It's not just something physical from a long ways away a lot of the time right is kind of what i'm thinking is going on and it really like this theory such so nicely ties up like a lot of the issues with like the problems with like the extraterrestrial theory like why don't they land on the white house lawn why aren't they you know it's just to say well it's because they're not aliens bro they're something else messing with us and it kind of seems like this has been happening for a long time yeah, and maybe they're not allowed to do something on a mass scale. If they are somehow tied into a spiritual realm, maybe that's not something they're allowed to do at this point. So they're just allowed to be these deceivers, essentially. Yeah, if they are biblical demons, like yes. they might have an appointed time, like what that um, <laughs> what that uh, entity talked about earlier on, Mister Orion, <laughs> where he said there was basically an appointed time when the veil would be lifted and that they yep. show themselves. It could be like, we got to wait till the end of the world, but until then, we get to just do mischief. And it kind of seems like that's what, like, the Pentagon disclosure stuff's leading up to. It just seems like a lot of stuff's kind of culminating that's been kind of being cultivated around the world for really hard for the last 80 years or so. Right. Yeah. The scary thing is, what if the government really doesn't know anything more than we do? What if they're just like, yeah, we see these things, but... You know, I don't know. I don't know. There's enough There's enough firsthand accounts of military people talking about interactions with things they believe to be actually aliens. So there's something physical going on. They are aware of it. Right. But I guess the theory here is, like, it, it can pop in and out of dimension. So it's not physical the way we think of it. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's like and there's some reports of things like that, and then there's other ones that seem... There are some that uh, accounts of like uh, extraterrestrials that do seem like they do have some sort of physical property restraint to them. They're not like dematerializing and all over the place. Like They have right. to get in a thing and take off. The thing's solid. You can touch it. But if Military thing, like... personnel talks about going on their ship. No, there are military personnel that talk about like more not so much like mechanics exactly but there are moving parts inside of some of these craft yeah or like little boards they like dip, 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 up, up, up. yeah they've got control boards there's things happening what if it really is an illusion though like what if and that might be yeah like that would be a huge prank like if roswell really happened but like it's all nonsense it's just a bunch of a port junk and, like, we have scientists trying to figure out, like, but we saw this thing. It defied the laws of physics. Like, we have to reverse engineer it. And there's, like, what if there's just, like, no way to reverse engineer it? Like, that would be... If it's not an actual thing. Like, it's, well, it is an actual thing, but it's just a hunk of metal that didn't actually do anything on its own, really. It was and, just a prank. Right, yeah. And then, then the government's spending, like, billions of dollars and, like, has all these secret programs. And, like, they're, like, think they're going to use it to win wars. And you're just, like, playing this joke. Like, that'd be a total demon thing to do. Yeah, that would. Just playing on how stupid humans are. <laughs> and think about all the stuff. I mean, what if Kennedy really was assassinated over, like, that stuff? Like, what if they have it? It's worthless, but they just, like, because we're just these, like, greedy little, grubby little warmongering monkeys, like, it's, like, tearing us apart. Like, you know, you have a secret government and everything over nothing. Oh. Man, that would be a really good joke. Let's be honest, though. That would be a good joke, yeah. That would be a really good joke. They're pranksters. Well. Well, that's what I got this week, Patrick. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, you put that together nicely. Um, just swaying me further in a direction I was already leaning is what I feel like that did. It's just more ammunition for, yeah, it just it seems like, again... A good majority of this isn't a physical thing that's doing it. It's, at a minimum, some sort of interdimensional being. Worst case scenario, it's demons. 
Yeah, it's something parapsychological, parapsychological at least. Yeah. So, well, thank you for listening, everybody. Please like, share, subscribe, um, and share with your friends. Uh, talk to people about us if you enjoy it. Give us word of mouth, which is huge. Yeah, Write us in your stories, man. If you've seen a ghost, a UFO, Bigfoot, I don't care what it is, man. Send us an email. Drop us a line on Facebook. Comment on YouTube. Let us yep. know, and we'll be in touch. So thanks as always, Patrick. This has been a fun fun thing to, to mess with you with. Yes, it was. It was a good time. All right, I'm not going to sleep tonight. <laughs> Me either. All right. Peace out, everybody. Love you. <laughs> Love you guys.